Santa, ah, 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 ah. I haven't got time to, I've got to find a whip space. And you can see my whole body pulling the body. Ah, ah. Or, ah, ah. I haven't got time to whip. Ah, ah. And I simply jump. The great Gary the Animal Spires said of his old friend Steve Morris, you would need an axe to stop him. A very big statement from the formidable Spires, who is admired as the pioneer of applied karate and mastering violence, but a true one. Okay, now I just want you to try that. Just try. So as I make the shot, I'm not spending. I'm not spending a lot of time on the what? On the shot. Because I know if I spend a lot of time on the shot, if I miss, I'm out of position. And if I put too much into the shot, I wind up with what? Broken hand. And if I make that shot, I want the shot to be what? Short. Behind the Mr. Nice Guy appearance and educated tones lies a man who suffered a tough, uncompromising childhood that prepared him physically and psychologically for the world of fighting. Steve Morris is without doubt an expert when it comes to violence, honed through decades of training and mastering different forms of martial arts across the world and producing a technique that is ultra aggressive and is focused on doing as much damage as possible. My hand is close to this guy, so if he's coming in, you can what? You're the one who's tying this guy up. Yeah. If you've got him back here, he comes in, you've got to put the hands at him. Yeah. Yeah. You've got your hands in a what? A catch position. Yeah. He has fought elite professional fighters from across the globe, been involved in hundreds of brutal street fights, worked the doors of London, and is truly the bad boy of traditional martial arts. Long before I ever considered entering the dojo of Bob Bolton and Steve O'Neill in 1967, from which I was expelled for rough play in 1968, I knew how to fight. I was also an athlete in my own right. On my very first night on the beginners course, Bob Bolton was amazed at what I could do, and I was immediately sent upstairs to train with a more experienced group. However, it was obvious to me and anybody else that was watching that my level of athleticism surpassed theirs. As I said, I could fight, but my unofficial version of fighting, as taught to me by my father, picked up watching Kung Fu, practiced in scuffles whilst at boarding school in Germany, and later in barrack room brawls and street fights while serving as a boy and regular soldier from 1958 to 1966 and supplemented by those moves that I had read about in books on boxing, wrestling, jiu-jitsu, judo and karate and that I had found to be effective on the streets. As a visitor one Saturday afternoon, I had broken someone's arm with a front kick whilst on my first official introduction to Kamite. I think it was my second night. I decked a Swedish second Dan with a vicious right cross setting a precedent for things to come. In every competition I had entered, I was disqualified for excessive contact, including the one in Holland against John Blooming's team. Growing tired of the game of tag my opponent was playing, I cornered him and kicked him straight in the groin, femoral artery with folded toes. He immediately passed out and went into shock with blood pouring from his nose. Fortunately for him and me, he later recovered. Every time there was Kumite in the dojo, there was a scrimmage in the lineup just to avoid pairing up with me, as there seldom was a time when somebody didn't get injured, including the time I dumped a certain individual hard into the mat, and when he called me a f bastard for doing so, promptly put a long, deep gash over his eye. He was immediately rushed to hospital, and I was banned from the dojo, and eventually expelled by Steve O'Neill and his bunch of cronies from the Kai Kushin Kai reputedly the strongest style of karate in the world. No matter how many times I was disqualified or admonished for heavy contact, I simply couldn't learn to miss. To me, a fight was a fight, period. Missing wasn't something I practiced or endorsed. The late Gary Spires recalled amusingly in a magazine how I put a dent in a Japanese second dance forehead in the exact shape of my knuckles, which were the size of small eggs at the time. And I believe my old friend Dickie Wu was still experiencing considerable pain years after I hit him in the jaw. 
Although I deeply regret injuring some people, others I do not. When someone came rushing in towards me, be him friend or foe, I simply couldn't check the impulse to hit him before he hit me, and the harder the better. My father's lessons of timing my shots at the precise moment the opponent was adjusting his position or shifting his weight towards me, had through repeated practice become instinctive. It's therefore not surprising that if some screaming Banzai Billy came rushing in square on with his hands down on his head up and mouth wide open, it was inevitable his face was going to collide with my fist. One such aspiring samurai once received a black eye, deviated septum and a chipped tooth, all from a single shot. Something else my father had taught me was to hit diagonally down like chopping wood with an axe, not only to increase the power, but also to increase the likelihood of hitting more targets. I suppose I'm someone who just loves the challenge of a real fight, irrespective of the superior size or reputation of my opponent. Even on the day of the previously mentioned incident that led to my expulsion, I had been sacked from coverages for headbutting and breaking the jaw of a fellow drainman for larger than myself, who was larger than myself and with a hard band reputation. Indeed, the whole reason I joined the Kaiokushin Kai in the first place is that following my dishonourable discharge from the army in 1966, for not only my belligerent attitude toward NCOs and officers, but for persistently fighting in barracks and amongst the local populace of Harrogate, Catterick, Nairobi, Benghazi and Bampton, it was not unknown for me to have two or three separate fights in a day. I knew that if I didn't get some positive direction to my aggressive violent behaviour, it was going to be sooner rather than later that I would be serving serious time at Her Majesty's pleasure. Due to disillusionment with the martial arts establishment, I returned to work as a hod carrier on the building sites around Reading. At one such site, stripped to the waist, I once gave an impromptu display of brick breaking to a group of office girls gathering at a window overlooking the building site. However, my display was interrupted by a co-worker, a journeyman professional boxer, who effectively asked me if I could do the same to a man, to which I replied, let's find out. So we were retired to the top of the building, and no sooner had the proceedings begun that I secured a hold on his head as he attempted to bob and weave in towards me, and I put two vicious knees into his face. He immediately collapsed in a heap, with blood pouring from a broken nose. It later transpired he also had a fractured cheekbone. Not that he was the first professional boxer I'd fought, the first being when I was a boy soldier at Harrogate. During a PT lesson, the assistant instructor, a professional boxer, during his national service, organised a last man standing milling contest, something which by way of my father, I was all too familiar with. It resulted in me dispatching two of his camp boxers and hospitalising a third with double vision. The proceedings having been brought to an immediate close, I was then marched into the office of the SMI, the Sergeant Major Instructor, and given a bollocking for hitting with the open glove. The SMI then asked me out of the blue if I was the son of Steve Morris. I said yes, and he said, Oh, well that explains it. With not much building work around Reading, I decided to move to London, and after doing several casual jobs, I was offered door work in the Angel by Peter Levy, a pub owner and former powerlifting champion, with whom Dickie Wu and myself worked out over at Bill Stevens Stratford Gymnasium. It was around the same time as summer in 1971, that by chance in Chinatown, I ran into Joseph Cheng of Wing Chun Fam, charismatic and with something completely new to show, he set me off on my study of Wing Chun. All I know is that I fight to win, and I never quit. Indeed, I have occasionally been stunned and often looked far worse than my opponent, but I have always managed to dig deep and call upon some hidden reserve to find a way of winning in the end. Even when on the brink of defeat, I was in Bangzai against an Italian armed with a knife and three Arabs, of not losing. In one incident, I recall poking my head round a corner to see what was going on, only to be greeted with a rounders back straight in the head. Not that it stopped me, I somehow managed to break my attacker's arm. I suppose the beatings I received as a child have somehow conditioned me to take a beating without panicking and remain focused on what might happen next and what I have to deal with it. I suppose if someone were to ask me which my strongest fighting attributes are, it wouldn't be my explosive power, speed, timing, agility and skills, etc. It would be my ability to take tremendous punishment and keep going. Which, when you think about it, is at the bottom line that usually separates winners from losers. 
Gary Spires and Brian Waits both recognise this. Gary, not only a martial artist in his own right, but a professional doorman for many years and a street fighter second to none, once said of me, it would take an axe to stop him. Brian, a highly regarded martial artist, once told an extremely agitated Irishman who indicated that he fancied his chances against me while watching me teach at the Surrey Docks Club in the East End to go home and get a shotgun because you'll need it. Someone else who probably realised this was a world karate champion and successful coach, considered by many to be the best in Britain, when in the early 1970s he refused to accept my challenge to come outside after a minor argument in a coffee shop in Belgium with other members of the BKA team present. So, these are just a few extracts from Steve's fascinating autobiography on his website, and I've left a link in the description to read in full. It's clear from the readings that Steve was disillusioned by karate and the different martial arts he excelled in, and he favoured the NHB fighting style, the No Olds Bard. Um, I would have liked to have known more about his time working the doors. There isn't, it doesn't go into big detail, it says that there was some kickoff with a serious firm at the time, there's not much more said. So if anyone else knows any more details about that, that'd be fantastic. And also, what's, what's happened to Steve? Is he still about? He's got quite um, extensive YouTube coverage of his, of his training and different things, which is interesting. If you look in the comments, which is always a tell, because um, I'm not a, an expert. I don't know anything about martial arts. I did a little bit when I was younger. My old man was a black belt in karate. So we know he would know a lot more than me. But... There's lots of people who trained under him and people like Terry O'Neill and Gary um, Spires, obviously, people at the top of the game who all spoke mad high of him. And this was actually a subscriber who told me to research him. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but yeah, any stories you can give me, I'd just fascinated to find out these new characters. Hope you enjoyed that little bit. Please get along to his website and read the full autobiography because it's really interesting about his background growing up um and you'll see what i mean because he doesn't look looks can be deceiving it's not always that big you know big skinhead looking hard man people come in all different shapes and sizes who are dangerous and uh this guy steve is definitely a professional in violence or was okay guys if you can hit the likes and subscribe if you're not done also i shall see you next time